All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so good morning. My name is uh, Ryan Erickson Kulas. I'm the programs director here at the Michelson 20MM Foundation. Uh, excited to share with you all today some details about our Spark grant cycle focused on our digital equity initiative. Um, I'll turn it over to my colleague Miguel to introduce himself. Buenos dias, good morning everybody. Miguel León, Senior Program Manager here at Michelson 20MM Foundation. Glad to be on the webinar with y'all. Thanks for joining. I uh, hope it's uh, informative. So just a quick overview of what our agenda looks like for today. Um, the first thing that we'll be doing is talking broadly, broadly about the foundation and our work. We'll then discuss the particulars of the SPARK grant program. We'll take a look at what the application and review process looks like. Um, we'll also highlight some previous awardees so y'all have a sense of the type of projects and programs that we supported in the past. Um, and then at the end, we'll have some Q&A. If you have questions throughout the webinar today, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A. Um, we will have time at the end to go through and answer any of those. So our organization is founded and funded by Dr. Gary K. Michelson. Dr. Michelson is a retired medical physician who made his fortune in inventing medical devices and then patenting those devices. Um, he has since retired and then devoted himself to philanthropy. He is not only a philanthropist in the education space, in the digital equity space, but he also operates an animal welfare foundation as well as a medical research foundation. He's a signer of the Giving Pledge as well. Our mission is to accelerate progress towards a more just world. We do that through grant making, policy work, um, and supporting organizations who are doing work on the ground. And I'd like to talk a little bit about each of our different initiatives. I know y'all are here today to learn about the digital equity work and we'll be touching on that shortly, but I wanted to give a brief highlight of the other areas of work that we do at the foundation. So the Michelson Institute for Intellectual Property is derived directly from how Dr. Michelson um, made his fortune and what his passions are in regards to IP. Uh, he wants to democratize IP and share education about that with the masses so that inventors, students, entrepreneurs can capitalize on their IP similar to how he did. Uh, he actually has a whole course curriculum built out that can be incorporated into higher education, high school, um, et cetera, and has massive reach across the country. The other thing that we do as a foundation is impact investing. So generally, these are investments in the ed tech for profit center. Um, and generally, they are companies that are mission aligned with the change that we are seeking to make in the world. Um, these are generally seed stage, so very early on. Um, and if you want to learn more, you can go to the Michelson Runway website and take a look at some of the companies that we've invested in. Around our educational access and success initiatives, the three that I wanted to quickly highlight before we transition into digital equity are open educational resources, smart justice, and student basic needs. Uh, open educational resources is actually how the foundation got its start. Dr. Michelson was very interested in the textbook affordability space. OER are openly licensed instructional materials, textbooks, et cetera, um, that can be utilized for free generally, digitally, and for extremely low cost via print options. Uh, our foundation is dedicated to spreading the use of those um, and ensuring that students have a equitable educational journey, particularly when it comes to their instructional materials. Our Smart Justice Initiative looks at the intersection of the criminal justice system and the higher education system. We look to support students that are justice involved, whether they are currently incarcerated or formally incarcerated. We also look to provide 
um, vocational opportunities for individuals that have been impacted by the criminal justice system. And then I'll turn it over to Miguel to talk about our student basic needs work, as well as our digital equity. Good morning again, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, our student basic needs initiative uh, tackles the real cost of college, especially non-tuition costs that place students in positions of uh, housing insecurity, homelessness, food insecurity, and overall financial instability. Um, this year, we're specifically looking at supporting uh, pregnant and parenting students, a huge project that we have launching at the beginning of this year. Uh, but in general, yeah, just trying to tackle students uh, or the challenges faced by students um, around basic needs. Our digital equity uh, initiative um, has really focused on sort of three overarching buckets, um, education and awareness, research and practice and movement building um, through our uh, virtual learning series, Connecting California. Uh, we've tried to bring together different uh, sectors from nonprofit to public to private, even the foundation world um, to discuss all the different uh, issues plaguing uh, community students uh, around the digital divides. Um, We've funded research uh, around the impact of digital inequity on college students. Uh, we've helped on putting together a clearer picture of uh, digital inequity in California uh, through research at USC, as well as uh, the Public Policy Institute of California. Uh, and we were first uh, grantors to the LA Deal, uh, a consortium of uh, organizations and different entities uh, coming together to uplift challenges faced by each of the communities in those sectors, public, private, nonprofit, et cetera. Um, next slide. A little bit about the Spark, Spark Grant program. Um, we hope to uh, provide catalytic uh, investments uh, that can be taken to scale. Uh, so these highly impactful projects uh, that uh, require sort of a quick infusion of dollars uh, that have uh, been uh, working hard on a specific issue um, that uh, are seeking sort of, uh, you know, uh, funding to uh, go to the next level in terms of partnership, in terms of curriculum, in terms of their efforts that they've been coordinating. Um, Spark grants are, uh, in our eyes, uh, innovative, uh, just in time. We hope that uh, they're timely investments. Um, and we like to, uh, uh, dub it as sort of a quick turnaround decision. If you apply for Spark Grants, uh, the turnaround uh, is fairly quick, six weeks, which is uh, sort of non-traditional within the philanthropic sector. For uh, this uh, round, uh, for the digital equity round, uh, the round will open February 15th and will close March 1st, 2022. So a quick uh, um, slide with bullet points on guidelines of uh, the Spark, Spark Grant Program is available to US-based nonprofits. Uh, for this round, uh, we're focusing on organizations that are doing work in California. Uh, those doing work outside of California will not be eligible for this opportunity. Uh, we're hoping to seek to fund efforts that uh, provide scalable solutions that can impact students statewide and are not limited to just one particular campus, for example, or one effort. Um, so it isn't necessarily like the devices, hotspots. Um, we're looking at uh, uh, partnerships, programs, projects that uh, can uh, affect systems change or state level change. Um, we'll be funding initiatives that provide direct, we won't be funding initiatives that provide direct assistance to students, as I mentioned. Uh, we know that there's a tremendous need uh, for that sort of support, uh, but we're looking to really leverage our dollars, again, to uh, affect uh, scalable change, scalable systems change, um, especially because digital inequity is such a multifaceted and complex issue and uh, quite an expensive one. So leveraging our dollars is uh, particularly important for uh, this uh, issue in particular. 
Thanks, Miguel. Um, the, the one thing that I'll, I'll add to this is, um, in addition to nonprofits, also educational um, institutions are eligible for funding. Um, generally, within a cycle, we see anywhere from 35 to 55 proposals. Um, I think 45 or high 40s is sort of the sweet spot. Um, and then we generally look to award anywhere from um, four to six grants uh, per cycle. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, what we evaluate um, when we review LOIs, full applications, and sort of what the grant committee looks for um, in proposals. These are the six dimensions of evaluation, um, and we'll be going in-depthly into each of these. So first, we want to make sure that a proposal hits our baseline criteria. Um, our funding, our asks up to $25,000. So we ask organizations to um, you know, submit how much they're looking for funding. We're generally looking for a specific self-contained milestone. So we don't fund you know, general operating expense grants via our SPARC grant program. We're generally looking to seed a project, seed a pilot program. Um, you know, maybe you're at an inflection point at an organization and you're looking to grow a particular program that's proven out. Um, those are the types of projects that, that we're interested in funding. And then I'll turn it back over to Miguel to talk about kind of the specifics of for digital equity, um, what we're looking to focus on. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, and you'll learn a little bit more uh, later in the presentation about uh, the committee that we pieced together to help us delineate these focus areas. One of the things that we've wanted to do at 20MM is really hear from folks closest to uh, the issues, uh, those that uh, are springing up solutions um, in real time. Uh, so you'll hear more about that um, in just a bit, but in terms of the focus areas that they helped us uh, piece together, um, one issue that was top of mind was the debate between unserved and underserved uh, communities uh, and the sort of uh, myth of overbuilding that industry has put forth. Um, so for this Digital Equity Spark Grant Round, we're looking for uh, efforts that inform, uh, engage, and bring together diverse groups to elevate and take action against this false narrative? Uh, what is it that uh, community organizations, institutions are doing uh, to counter it and to say, uh, my community uh, is underserved, it uh, requires attention as much as, uh, quote unquote, these underserved areas of our state. Um, we know that there's swaths of uh, urban communities that uh, despite having some uh, access, uh, that access or broadband access is inadequate. So we're really trying to counter that false narrative put forth by industry um, of uh, overbuilding, uh, uplifting this debate of unserved uh, versus uh, underserved um, and highlighting that underserved communities need support as well. Um, digital navigator models uh, came up in conversation with uh, uh, the digital equity leaders that we spoke with. Um, trusted actors uh, that uh, are in community, that are part of nonprofit organizations, that um, have become uh, digital literacy navigators, um, that help uh, folks connect to, to broadband, that help folks learn uh, about how to use devices. Uh, so for this round, we're looking for efforts that uh, take that digital navigator model beyond basic digital literacy uh, and leverage them to help users connect to supplemental resources. Um, we know that overnight, once the pandemic hit, nonprofit organizations became digital equity organizations, no matter what their focus was, whether education, health, et cetera. And a lot of their leaders uh, helped uh, uh, folks in community connect, but now we're hoping to see what efforts are out there um, that sort of transcend that basic digital literacy uh, and help folks connect to SNAP, uh, WIC, other public social services. Um, we're also looking for efforts that uplift the experience of students and their families. 
uh, digital equity leaders that we spoke with uh, really wanted us to uh, capture in real time uh, that sort of qualitative information and qualitative data that uh, is very real. Um, so folks experiencing digital inequity in neighborhoods, in community, uh, we're hoping to uh, partner with somebody that uh, is capturing that, that is telling that story, that is sharing that narrative uh, with the current progress in the digital equity space. Uh, we know that there's gonna be uh, renewed da data, uh, hopefully improved data, but to accompany that and to continue to advocate for uh, communities in need, we're hoping to couple that with uh, the narratives of folks experiencing uh, inequity. One of the things that we discussed with digital equity leaders was also um, what's out there in terms of uh, digital inclusion resources. How is it that we take them to scale? Uh, we think that there are a good amount of organizations uh, that might have compiled uh, literature on this is how you connect to uh, you know, subsidies from the state federal government. Uh, but we're not sure to what extent they've been taken to scale. Uh, we conceive this as sort of a landscape analysis and literature review of existing resources so that we can uh, compile sort of that definitive uh, material uh, to then share uh, across the state. Um, and lastly, uh, efforts that can be taken to scale across the state uh, focused on the points of intersectionality uh, for advancing digital equity. Um, so I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, digital equity touches upon a host of uh, different uh, issue areas that we all work on from health to education, civic engagement, et cetera. Uh, what efforts are folks uh, working on uh, that are at the intersection of digital equity and health? What uh, efforts are folks working on that are at the intersection of uh, digital equity and education? Uh, if you've pieced together coalition, a project, a uh, curriculum uh, that sort of bridges the divide within each of those issue areas, we'd love to hear about it. Thanks, Miguel. Um, and to clarify, um, we'll ask uh, an organization to select one or potentially multiple of these focus areas that their work would be addressing when they submit an LOI. Um, there's no advantage to selecting multiple focus areas in your LOI. Um, really, I think we look at sort of how strongly you would be, your work would be addressing that focus area. So moving forward in terms of how we think about evaluating proposals, um, we want to get a clear sense of what the impact of the grant is going to be. How many individuals do you see being impacted both in the short term as well as the long term? Um, so we do ask organizations to provide their own impact metrics uh, to kind of judge how the program will be deemed successful. And that can we look kind of in the short term within a you know, six month timeline, we also are interested in long term impact of the work as well. We really want to get a better sense of um, what those metrics particularly look like. Um, so we're curious to learn, you know, how do you all evaluate success and how do you track success through the work that you do? We also want to get a better sense of you as an organization. Um, so we'll ask in our full application to have a better understanding of the team that is working on a project. Um, we want to learn about what your revenue streams are, um, what other grants you may have been awarded and how those outcomes of those grants were. Um, but again, kind of getting a holistic sense of your organization. And then lastly, we're really interested in scalability. Um, so we're generally drawn towards work that you know, may have a local impact or a regional impact, but could potentially have something that could scale across the state. Now that might not be with our grant dollars, um, that might be sort of in future iterations of the work, um, but generally we're very interested in having projects or having work that um, scales. 
So in terms of um, the actual kind of process for applying, um, we will open our call for proposals on February 15th. Um, if you go to 20mm.org slash spark hyphen grants, um, you will have, have a button right now, it's to register for this webinar, but as you can see in this screenshot, um, event, you know, it'll say submit a proposal. Um, from there, you will be able to submit your LOI. The LOIs are pretty straightforward. Generally, what we are looking for, other than sort of information, you know, name, contact information, what your focus area is, um, but really the heart of the LOI is a 500 word abstract on what you're proposing grant funding for. We really try to make it a very simple process um, to submit an LOI. We'll then review those LOIs and invite selected LOIs into a full application. We use a grant management platform called Submittable. So when you click on that submit a proposal button, it will bring you to Submittable. Um, you will create an account on Submittable, and then that's where you'll be submitting and housing all your information. Communication with us will be occurring on Submittable. Um, I highly recommend, and we have this as a reminder in the LOI as well, to whitelist Submittable in your email client, making sure that you're actually receiving those emails. We've had instances in the past where certain spam filters, particularly at educational institutions, um, will block communications from Submittable. I just dropped in the chat the link as to how to do that. Um, if there are technical issues during the process, if you can't get Submittable to load or you're trying to submit something or you can't save something, um, certainly, um, you know, we, we would help if we can, but we are not the tech experts. So we would recommend reaching out to um, support at submittable.com. And generally someone will get back to you um, within about a, a 24 to 48 hour period. This is our grant committee and the individuals will sort of be evaluating and making determinations around who we end up having in our awardee cohort. Obviously, in a, there's myself and Miguel. Um, we also have our senior leadership involved in the process, um, our CEO, Phil Kim, uh, as well as our COO, Myra Lumbera. Uh, both of those individuals have been with the organization uh, for over a decade. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Miguel to talk about our Spark Community Advisors. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, mentioned this earlier um, as a burgeoning practice here at Michelson 20MM. One of the things that we wanted to do is to hear from folks in community uh, on the ground uh, closest to the issues that we try and work on here at our foundation. Uh, and so our Spark Community Advisors uh, are partners, uh, friends in the digital equity space, uh, in the higher education space uh, that we convened uh, to guide us, to give us a sense of where is the white space in uh, digital equity work? Where are the gaps? Uh, what is it that we need to work on? Um, what can we partner uh, on with uh, folks seeking to uh, receive a grant from our foundation. Um, and so we're super proud um, because this is sort of a best practice within the philanthropic sector as well, participatory grant making. Um, not only will the folks that you see on the screen, um, not only will they you know, piece together the key target outcomes that we shared, but they'll also uh, help us in some of the decision-making for uh, grants uh, that we'll make during this round. Uh, particularly proud of uh, including students um, in the process. Uh, one student from SFSU, uh, one student from UCLA, Go Bruins, um, and uh, some tremendous partners that uh, we've met along the way during our uh, journey to bridge the digital divides here in California. Uh, so super proud of it. Uh, some of them might be colleagues for you, um, but uh, again, yeah, they're guiding us and helping us decide um, so that we stay uh, informed and close to the ground uh, on this issue. And so just looking a little bit at sort of what the process looks like for submitting um, an LOI. So again, it's that 500 word um, abstract. 
uh, you'll submit that and the grant committee will do an initial assessment. Um, I should note that if you go to our SPARC grant webpage, um, you will actually see, and, and Miguel, maybe you could drop uh, or hit, uh, the link to the SPARC grant page in the chat or Jen, if, if you're able to do that as well. Um, but there is already PDF files of both of the LOI and the full application um, available for you all to view. So if you wanted to get started on your LOI um, during, you know, prior to the cycle kind of call for proposals opening on February 15th, you can certainly do that. Um, thanks, Jen. Thanks, Miguel. And so the LOI is submitted within six business days, you'll be notified as to whether or not your proposal will be moving forward in the process. Um, if your proposal does move forward, you'll be asked to submit a full application. Again, that will be done on submittable. A PDF version of that full application is available um, on the website right now. One thing to note is in addition to the questions that are listed in that application, um, we will also be asking specific questions about your LOI um, that the grant committee has after reviewing it. Um, those full applications will be assessed and then we'll designate finalists. We'll then bring in our Spark community advisors to review those finalists and help us to inform our decision making process. We may schedule follow up calls with finalists, depending on if there's more uh, information that's needed. Um, but our goal is to have sort of decisions around awardees within six weeks of our call for proposal closing. This is just a visual representation of uh, that process in case you're a visual learner. LOI is received, rejected or moved forward, a full application is completed, finalists are then reviewed by Spark Community Advisors, finalist calls may occur, and then a final decision. And I'll turn it over to Miguel to talk about some of our past digital equity awardees. Hey again, everybody. Wanted to include um, past digital equity awardees just to give folks a sense of uh, successful proposals that came through the pipeline uh, last round. Um, we'll start with uh, our friend and partner, Everyone On. Uh, our grant uh, to everyone on uh, supported the development of a uh, robust, robust digital inclusion training program um, that uh, was taken to scale across the state. Uh, everybody from nonprofits to K-12 organizations, public housing agencies received information uh, on uh, digital literacy um, and digital inclusion. Uh, in particular, I want to highlight the, the fact that it wasn't uh, focused on one organization, uh, one region, it was definitely uh, taken to scale across the state. And that's generally what we like to see in uh, the efforts that we fund through SPARC grants. We also partnered with the Public uh, Policy Institute of California. Uh, our SPARC grant to them supported their efforts, uh, which used uh, uh, state representative data to examine digital equity gaps and how they changed from spring 2020 to spring 2021. Uh, they in addition to uh, gathering that info, uh, presented uh, policy options uh, to address the remaining challenges. They actually hosted a webinar um, uplifting the brief, the info that they, that they pieced together, the work that they did. Um, really, really glad that uh, we partnered with them. Some tremendous information that came from their work. Um, and we also partnered, uh, as I mentioned, or I might've mentioned earlier with uh, Unite LA and uh, LAEDC uh, that pieced together the LA deal uh, with funding from our grant. Um, Unite LA and LAEDC launched uh, the LA Digital Equity Action League, uh, which is a regional community-driven consortium focused on eliminating the digital divide through a collaborative and multi-sector process. Uh, absolutely proud of the work done via this effort because if uh, you might've heard, uh, the LA deal was chosen by the CPUC and funded by the CPUC to become the representative LA County consortium uh, working on digital equity. So uh, again, a catalytic support that was taken to scale and is having a broader uh, impact in our state on this issue. 
And we also partnered with uh, USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, in particular, the work of Dr. Hernan Galperin uh, at USC. Um, with support from our SPARK grant, they expanded their Connected Communities and Inclusive Growth Project from LA County to the entire state. So uh, huge conversations in this space around data, around mapping, around getting uh, appropriate and adequate data and maps uh, to be able to make uh, sound decisions uh, around how to move forward in terms of achieving digital equity, especially for particular neighborhoods. Um, this is a huge, huge, huge resource uh, in the space uh, that can help uh, uh, drive policy decisions, policy solutions. Um, yeah, super, super happy with uh, our partnership with uh, USC Annenberg and Dr. Renan Lamperin. And uh, in addition to the digital equity uh, grantees that we identified last round, we also wanted to share uh, and highlight other partners that uh, we've uh, worked with. Uh, again, just to give you a sense of successful proposals, uh, California State University Long Beach came through our Student Basic Needs Spark Grant Round, um, and we partnered with them uh, to scale their uh, pregnant and parenting student work. Uh, specifically, they're piecing together an ally training as well as a manual on how to make campuses family friendly. Um, and so they're taking these resources and we'll be sharing them with all 23 CSU campuses. Um, one project, one effort at one campus that is then shared across an entire system. Uh, beyond that, uh, CSULB helped us wrap our heads around how to best support the student population. And internally here at 20MM, we've decided to build out an entire pregnant and parenting student project uh, focused on helping and supporting uh, pregnant and parenting students. Uh, again, catalytic uh, support, catalytic, catalytic work. Uh, that's now having uh, impact at, uh, at a broader scale. Thanks, Miguel. Um, and I'll just quickly highlight uh, three more grantees. Um, UCI Lifted is the a grantee through our Smart Justice work. Um, they are in the process of establishing the first UCBA program uh, in a prison setting. Um, that cohort of first uh, students will be starting this fall. Um, again, this was one of a good example of a type of project where um, you know we came in early and seeded some of the early work, but there were multiple funders supporting this effort. And again, those are definitely the types of opportunities that we are open to where we are um, you know, coming into a larger project, but our dollars are allocated towards a certain aspect of that work. US Public Interest Research Group is a Spark grantee in our Open Educational Resources Initiative. Um, our grant funded a report looking at the uh, textbook industry's new automatic billing framework, um, also known as inclusive access. Um, this report has proven to be quite influential within the field. Uh, it's been cited in multiple class action lawsuits against textbook publishers. Um, also, there's been legislation introduced in California, in Texas, um, sort of looking at automatic billing framework. And you know, this report has been instrumental and cited in those policy efforts. So um, you know, a, a research, an example of a research project that sort of had a wider impact beyond just sort of that initial um, study. And then lastly, I wanted to just highlight California Competes. They are actually one of our newest grantees. Uh, they were awarded a SPARC grant in our last Smart Justice cycle, which uh, wrapped in December. They have a post-secondary to prosperity dash dashboard, um, which looks at disaggregated data around the state focused on higher education and is utilized by policymakers in terms of making decisions. Our funds will help them to expand that dashboard to include um, data related to incarceration and incarcerated students um, with the goal of sort of having a more holistic view uh, 
it allows policymakers to sort of drive change and help those particularly vulnerable population of students. So that kind of concludes our presentation. We wanted to um, leave some time to answer any questions that you may have. Again, if you do have questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. It looks like we have um, a few in there already. We are also happy to um, field questions via email, uh, connect with you. Um, so our emails are up there on the screen. Oftentimes we like to um, provide feedback to organizations in advance of submitting an LOI or a proposal. So if you have a, you know, maybe a few ideas as to what you're interested in suggesting, you can shoot us an email and say, you know, hey, here are two or three sentences on you know, project A, here are two or three sentences on project B. You know, are, is one stronger than the other? We always like to kind of provide that feedback. Um, also, you know, we know that a you know, maybe a quick thirty-minute meeting can uh, be really helpful when it comes to you know saying, oh yes, absolutely, apply for an LOI and make sure that you include information X, Y, and Z so that the grant committee has a holistic view of the work. Or um, you know, we might be able to provide some feedback saying, we don't think that this is a great fit for us at this point in time. And then it sort of saves you all the time, energy, and effort of submitting an LOI. So we're certainly open to, um, you know, providing any feedback, both leading up to the 15th um, and up until the call for proposal closes on March 1st. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll turn over the Q&A. Um, Estella. Can an institution apply and be funded more than once if we applied for this project, but also wanted to apply for the next cycle that addresses basic need? Um, yes, certainly um, not a problem in terms of applying for uh, multiple cycles. Um, our student basic needs cycle will um, be in quarter three of this year. Um, so just kind of a heads up in regards to timing around that. Um, but yeah, we're certainly open to um, funding an institution, particularly if it's a school, because generally it's, you know, different wings of that school that are that are doing work. Um, are municipal government agencies eligible for grants? Are organizations with fiscal receivership slash sponsor through, through a 501c3 eligible for grants? Um, yes, definitely. If you um, have a fiscal sponsorship through a 501c3, you would be eligible for a grant. Um, for municipal government agencies, um, Miguel, I don't know if you know the answer to that question. Um, we could probably find a way to work with them, but Miguel, I don't know if you've had conversations with municipal government agencies in the past. We haven't. I think uh, for this one, we should uh, maybe guide ourselves by if it's a 501c3, we will partner um, with them. I think that's like sort of like the basic uh, um, guideline right um in the past we have partnered with a uh partnership that included a for-profit entity that had a foundation um slash 501 c3 arm that partnered with a community college to piece together uh, a manual on uh, how to address student homelessness uh, and housing insecurity uh, so that was a creative approach that they pieced together uh to um you know, provide or put forth solutions uh, on the student basic needs front. Um, so I'd say uh, contemplate who, uh, as part of your partnership, would be that 501c3 that would uh, partner with 20MM. We're open to uh, those innovative approaches and those public-private partnerships uh, that are seeking, you know, to uplift uh, solutions, uh, especially on this issue area, because we know it's so expensive that not one entity, not one organization might have the, the funds or the uh, infrastructure uh, necessary to tackle it. Yeah, and, and an honest attendee, if you have, um, you know, specifics that you want to discuss with us, you know, feel free to, to shoot us an email and we can kind of answer it more directly. Uh, Miguel, I think this next question is probably for you. Uh, will you fund projects that provide digital literacy programs for adults or should it focus on youth? Generally at 20MM, we do higher ed focused work. Uh, digital equity um, has been the space where we have sort of gone outside of that traditional space. Um, I'd say we're open to, we're open to hearing about uh, the project. If you wanna shoot us an email, we can talk through it. Um, it's been the space that's taken us uh, even into a bit of the K-12 space, even though uh, our focus is uh, equity access and success in post-secondary education. 
for underrepresented students, but we're open to chatting. Um, yeah, because I mean, it's so multifaceted, so com complex that uh, these traditional buckets of work um, often uh, sort of bur blur that uh, that boundary for, for, for our foundation. So uh, happy to chat about it, Hit, uh, send us an email. Great. Um, it looks like we answered all the questions in the Q and A. So I'll give maybe another minute or two if anyone has any lingering questions. But of course, certainly feel free to reach out to us via email. Um, as Jen mentioned in the chat, this it has been recorded, so we'll be sending it out to the attendees. We'll also be sending out um, this deck as well as a PDF, so you can reference it. Um, copies of the LOI are available as well as the application on our website and yeah we look forward to reviewing proposals um starting with the call for proposals opening on the 15th and we'll be reviewing those on a rolling basis so um get them in early thank you all so much for joining us and we hope everyone has a great day thanks everybody